In past episodes of Real Chemistry, we've talked about significant figures, what they are, and why they're important. But here we're going to talk in a little more detail about how you handle significant figures if you're, say, actually doing chemistry in the laboratory. So, for example, let's say that you want to determine the density of some object. And you go into the lab and you measure the mass of that object and the volume of that object. Those two variables are the things you need to calculate the density, as we can see in the equation below. But you have a problem now. I know how many sig figs my mass has, and I know how many sig figs my volume has, but how many sig figs should my density have once I do that calculation? So the question we're gonna answer in this video is, how do I know how many significant figures a result of a calculation should have? And the rules turn out to vary some depending on whether you're doing multiplication and division or addition and subtraction. So what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna talk about the rules that you use to determine how many significant figures your answer from a calculation should have. So first we're gonna talk about the rules for multiplication and division. If you're not sure what significant figures are, I recommend you first go back and watch my video counting significant figures before continuing. So okay, we've gone into the lab and we wanna determine the density of some object. We measured its mass, it's 40 grams. And we measured its volume, it's 14 milliliters. So now we wanna know when I compute the density, how many significant figures should that answer have? And the simple rule of thumb for multiplication and division is keep the fewest sig figs. What do I mean by that? I'll spell that out now. So this process, I've broken it down into three steps. And the first step just says, determine the number with the fewest sig figs. So all we're gonna do here is we're gonna count how many sig figs each of the numbers that we're putting into our uh, calculation have. And so up top, we have this 40.00 grams. And there we have one, two, three, four sig figs. Remember those two or those three zeros at the end are significant because they're trailing zeros and there's a written decimal point. So that top number has four sig figs. On the bottom we have 14 milliliters and there we're just gonna have one, two sig figs because all non-zeros are significant. So we're doing a calculation here. One of our numbers has four sig figs, one has two. So we've just done step one. We've identified which one has the fewest sig figs. Which one is it? It's, it's our volume. 14 milliliters has the fewest significant figures, just two. Okay, so step two says go ahead and, and just do the calculation and write out the full answer. So at this point, you're going to go to your calculator and you're going to type in 40 divided by 14. And when you do that, what you're going to get is 2.8571. And the units there, remember, are grams, G for grams, and ML for milliliters. All right, so we've performed the calculation. And now step three says round the answer to the fewest sig figs. What's the fewest sig figs? Well, in this problem, 14 milliliters only had two sig figs. So we're going to want to round our answer to two significant figures. So basically that means we're going to want to keep these first two guys here. And remember, when we round... We always wanna look at the number behind the number we're rounding to see if we round it up or round it down. Let me show you what I mean. So we know the first number is two, and then we're gonna take that eight and we're gonna round it up to a nine. Why do we round it up? Because right after the eight, we see this five, and the standard rounding rules tell us that if the number behind what we're rounding is five or above, we round up. If it's below five, we round down. So in this situation, we're gonna round up because we have a five behind that eight and still our units are grams per milliliter. So that's our answer to the correct number of significant figures. What that's telling us is if we measured the mass and we knew it out to two decimal places, a total of four significant figures, and we measured the volume and we only knew two significant figures, then our answer for our density shouldn't have any more significant figures than the least precise number that we took a measurement of. So that's why these rules maybe make sense, is that you, you keep the least precise number of sig figs. So you keep the fewest number of sig figs. Now, that was an example of a division problem. Next, we're gonna do a multiplication problem, but the rules are identical. And you'll notice here now we're not dealing with a specific example like mass and density and volume. We're just dealing with numbers multiplying together. And it doesn't matter what the units of your numbers are. The rules for determining how many sig figs the result of a computation should have are the same. So it doesn't matter what the units are. Okay, so step one says determine the fewest sig figs, the number with the fewest sig figs. So we see 2.71 
and that has one, two, three sig figs because all non-zeros are significant figures. And then we see 1.500, and that has four sig figs because trailing zeros are significant if there's a written decimal point, and we can see that written decimal point right in that number. Okay, so which number has the fewest sig figs? That would be this guy with three sig figs. Step two says, go ahead and perform that calculation and write the full answer. So that's the next step. If we plug that guy into our calculator, 2.71 times 1.5, we'll get out 4.065. Now, how many places should we, how many significant figures should we keep in that number? Well, three, these three, because our, the number with the fewest sig figs was 2.71, and that just had three sig figs. So we want our answer to have three significant figures. Again, we need to take into account our rounding rules. So when we round, we'll see that we get 4.07. Again, we round up because this number behind the six is five or greater. So that's the rules for multiplying and dividing. And they don't change if we just add more terms in our multiplication or division problem. So here we see we're multiplying or dividing three numbers, but the rules are identical. So we just determine the number with the fewest sig figs. And here we see our 3.03 .03 has three sig figs. That zero in the middle is what we call a sandwich zero. It's between significant figures. So that guy's significant. Next we have 1.251. All non-zeros, so all sig figs. Lastly, we have 110. There we just have two sig figs. Why is that zero not significant? Well, it's a trailing zero and there's no written decimal point. So remember, trailing zeros are kind of the tricky zero, where they're significant if there's a written decimal point, but not if there's no written decimal point. So we just have two sig figs there. So which number has the fewest sig figs? This guy, 110, has two sig figs. So our answer should have two sig figs. All right, so now we go ahead and we perform the calculation. That's step two. So we perform the calculation, and if we plug that three those three numbers into our calculator, we get 0 0.03445. And how many sig figs should we keep? Well, we look at the number with the fewest sig figs that went into our calculation, that would be 110, and it had two sig figs, so we're gonna keep two sig figs. So we just wanna keep these two guys. And now, once again, we're gonna round, and when we follow those rounding rules, this time we see that there's a four right after it, and so that's below five, so we don't round up. So our answer is just 0 0.034. Okay, so that covers the rules for multiplying and dividing. Next what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the rules for adding and subtracting. They're just slightly different. So for adding and subtracting, the rule is keep the fewest decimals. By that I mean keep the fewest numbers past the decimal point. Let me explain. So. Once again, three steps. Step one says determine the number with the fewest decimals. So what I mean by that is just count up how many numbers you have past the decimal point and write that down. So 12 has zero numbers past the decimal point. So I'll put zero D. This guy, however, has one, two, three numbers past the decimal point. So which one has fewer numbers past the decimal point? Well, 12. So then I'm gonna add them together and I'm gonna keep the full number. That's step two. Looks a lot like step two from our previous problems. And when I do that, I'm gonna get 12.001. Final step for addition subtraction problems, round the answer to the fewest decimals. Okay, so the input, my number that I put into the calculation that has the fewest decimal places is 10. It had no numbers past the decimal. So similarly, my answer should have no numbers past the decimal. So I'm gonna get rid of this guy and this guy, and this guy. Once again, I follow my standard rounding rules, but I see that behind the two there, there's a zero. And that zero, obviously not gonna make us round that two up. So that's our final answer, 12. And this should hopefully make sense because basically what it's saying is if you add two things together and one's really big and you don't know it very well, and I just add something really small to it, that basically I haven't changed the number. So 12, if I'm not sure that that number is exactly 12, when I add 0 .001 to it, well, it's still basically just some number around 12. All right, 
So let's go on to subtraction. It works exactly the same way. Here we have 1.0024 minus 0 0.521. And we're going to follow the same steps. Determine the number with the fewest decimals. So here, this guy has one, two, three, four numbers past the decimal point. So I'm just going to put a four. And here we have one, two, three numbers past the decimal point. That means our answer should just have three numbers past the decimal point. So we go ahead and perform the calculation. That's step two. And we're going to write down that full answer. So when I do that, I plug that into my calculator. And that's going to give me 0 0.41, or I'm sorry, 0.4814. How many of those decimal places do I want to keep? Just three. Because the number I put into this calculation with the fewest numbers past the decimal had three. So I keep three. That means I'm going to get rid of this four. Again, I follow my standard rounding rules, and here we see that since I have a four after the one, I'm not going to round the one up, and I get the answer of 0 0.481. All right, one last addition and subtraction example. Again, here we can see if I just add a bunch of terms, it doesn't change how these rules operate. So step one says determine the number with the fewest decimals. Again, we're going to see here we have two numbers past the decimal, here we have two numbers past the decimal, here we have one number past the decimal, and for 10, we have zero numbers past the decimal. So this guy tells us how many numbers we want to keep past the decimal. We go ahead and we plug that in to our calculator. And if we do that, we'll see that we get minus 88.07. So that's step two, perform the calculation. How many decimals should I, how many numbers past the decimal should I keep? None of them. So I get rid of both of these guys. Remember, that's because 10, which I put into my calculation, had no numbers past its decimal point. So that means when I write down my answer, I'll just get minus 88. Again, the rounding rules here say I don't need to round up because I had a 0 past that 8. And so I just get the final answer of minus 88. So that does it for this episode of Real Chemistry. We've learned how to track significant figures through a calculation. And so whenever you do a calculation, you got to follow those significant figures or those decimal points and think about how many significant figures or numbers past my decimal point should my answer have. If you have any questions, please leave those below. As always, you can subscribe to get updates about my video or videos or visit my channel.